All right. I think uh, at this point we can go ahead and start the session. So uh, I'll start with just a brief introductions uh, for the webinar and, and basic rules for the webinar, and then we will uh, let Logan go through the presentation. Um, so for today, we're going to be going through uh, better BDC workflows. And in this case, uh, just examples of a, a pretty cool project that had a lot of different challenges because of prefab work and uh, because of just schedule and, and many other factors. And so there was a use for a bunch of different tools on the project, but uh, Verity powered by Jetstream was one of those. And so today we're going to go through that and, and just talk about that experience. Uh, for the workflow uh, and just for the webinar, uh, we have a couple different rules. And so for that, uh, Logan, if you could jump to the next slide. Uh, we have a uh, first thing standard process for webinars. Uh, everyone is muted. Uh, there are a, there's a question section in the chat. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, please put those in and then we will cover questions at the end of the session. So uh, we won't go into those, you know, kind of as we're going through it, but we'll keep an eye on that and, uh, and we will cover it as we go. Um, this is being recorded, so you know we can definitely uh, we will send this out a couple days after the the webinar now, so that you can review it, uh, and and we'll we'll send that so you can uh, take a look. Okay. Um, so Logan, I'll let you introduce yourself. So thanks for having me. Um, my name is Logan McGinnis. I am a BDC manager with the Whites Company, based in South Florida. Um, been focusing past year and a half really on reality capture workflows, including laser scanning integration with MEPF coordination, um, QA and QC analysis, and scan to BIM. So we'll talk a little bit about some of our QA and QC on um, my latest project down in South Florida. Um, I have a background in architecture and design, and I, fun fact, appeared in a number of late 90s and early 2000s TV commercials. Probably saw one of those. Um, cool. Uh, and Eric, I will uh, let you introduce yourself as well. All right, sounds good. So I'm Eric Ritchie. I'm a product manager at Lega Geosystems. Uh, you know, I've been around a, a little bit, and uh, I look after, in addition to all of our uh, powered by Jetstream products, I'm also the uh, the product manager in charge of all of our CloudWorks products. Um, I did not get the memo about the fun fact, but uh, just to throw something out, I have uh, licked an iceberg in the North Atlantic. So something random for you. That's pretty good. Uh, and I will go ahead and do myself here. So my name is Justin Domer. Uh, I'm a product manager at ClearEdge 3D, uh, primarily focusing on Edgewise, but also working with uh, Verity and some of our other products. I've uh, been with ClearEdge for about eight years, uh, worked kind of all over with different companies, and uh, like rock climbing, and I, I was recently stranded in, in uh, Australia for a bit, and uh, have thankfully made it back to the U.S. Um, so yeah, cool. All right, well, uh, that's pretty much it for the introduction. So at this point, I will uh, leave it up to Logan to uh, go through your presentation and, and show everyone what you've been working on. Great. So um, yeah, as part of this again, this was uh, VDC and scanning that we did on our PGA office project in Florida and how we used Verity in it. So I'll just go through a little bit about the project, how it related to our ACM panel coordination, kind of the steps that we went through and things we had to work through to, to get the deliverables and to keep the project moving, some takeaways. Um, so just a little bit about the company. Whites is the sixth oldest AEC firm in the US, founded in 1855. We're the oldest commercial GC west of the Mississippi. We are a full service construction firm, GC, design builder, construction manager. Um, our headquarters is in Des Moines, Iowa, but I am based in our West Palm Beach office, as you can see in the arrow there on that map. Those are all of our offices, at least within the country. Our uh, parent company is, is international. Uh, about the project, so it's a $155 million new build of a corporate campus and office headquarters. It's Category 5 plus hurricane rated. We have a really complicated ACM panel skin system, a data center. Um, we have a helipad. It's it's a pretty pretty big pretty pretty big big com complex project. Um, so on here, this project, we've used VDC to assist in keeping project on track and schedule, coordination, QC documentation, just overall problem solving. We've hit a lot of different areas of of the project with with the VDC scope. 
So here's just some shots from the project. That's a rendering from our architect and just some different images of, of us capturing scans. And again, for agenda, we're just gonna go through the original scope of it, the revised scope, um, kind of everything we had to do and steps we had to take to get to the end goal where we needed to be. So the, the focus of laser scanning and using Verity for this portion of the project was on our aluminum composite panel skin system. That was um, originally we, the original scope we had planned to do an entire as-built scan of the structure and provide that to the subcontractors to um, work a uh, delegated framing design around and to prefabricate models based off of that as-built scan. Um, that changed to a bit of a revised scope just due to supply chain issues. We basically had to pull the trigger and prefab these panels based off the design model. I think at the time we kind of needed that as-built scan. There was still some steel that wasn't in place. We we're having some survey issues. So um, the revised scope kind of became a coordination effort to ensure that these panels that were prefabricated from the model fit on the steel substructure. So it became kind of a steel conformance check and, and we would have to see how we could uh, modify this delegated framing design and or modify steel, modify panels to get it to fit. So, yeah. so the end goal was to, to overlay scans on the model check steel conformance, advise on discrepancies, and make, it, make adjustments to framing accord, accordingly. Um, so to do this, our, the considerations we had to take into account were number one, uh, we needed a federated model to compare the scans against. So a big haul was getting all the subs aligned for one cohesive design model. And the next consideration was how we were gonna capture scans given the size of the project, the limitations of the site, and some line of sight issues. So we'll go through some of that. Third was how do we check that these scans are accurate? And fourth is how do we get the model and the point clouds to actually overlay? Especially when you're coming from a design coordinate system and like a real world state plane. So went through some, some work to get those all working. So <clears throat> first with our federated model, again, we had all these trade models and different authoring platforms and I think at the inception of the project, we didn't have a coordinate system clearly defined. It was kind of just um, everyone went off of the design coordinate system. And you know, some some subs are great in Revit and, and other modeling programs, and not not every sub is is super savvy with survey points and project base points. So um, it's a bit of a haul getting everyone together. But once we assigned the, this point to get all the trade models into the same cohesive file. Um, we had a federated model of all of our MEPF for coordination purposes, as well as all of our exterior structures. So concrete, curtain wall, framing, these ACM panels, concrete. And we were able to take this model and use this to compare the scans against. So once we had this model, um, we had to start thinking about how to process or sorry, how to um, capture these scans. So some unique things that Whites did again, based on the limitations of the site and line of sight issues that we had. Um, we would scan a portion of the building, um, just focusing on like the limitations and parameters that we had to take into consideration, how far apart setups could be. We really refined our technique to make sure that we were getting really nice, tight, strong bundles from our RTC 360 uh, scanner. Had to consider distances between, between setups, uh, distances from targets to make sure that we were capturing everything. We would process all these in Register 360, uh, assign our, our targets and control to it, so geolocating our scans so it was not just floating in space, but it was actually tied to a real, real world coordinate system and a real location. We'd clean them up. Sometimes we'd export them to 3DR or recap and clean them up after a bit more as well. And this would allow us to bring either this LGS file that is proprietary to Leica or our RCP file, which is the Autodesk friendly version into Navis. Um, but again, one thing we had to take into account capturing these scans, there were some areas where 
we were not able to see everything that we needed to, spe specifically on that little red portion you see there, our WT1C panels, as we call them. Um, we had to take into consideration how to view that from our garage roof. And then there were areas where we couldn't see like, the top of our steel monitor pans from the ground. So we had to come up with a system that would allow us to capture all of these points and all of this data that we couldn't see just from the ground or that was too far away to ensure that we were getting um, an, a level of accuracy that was that was needed for this project. So we went through a few different iterations of how to do this. We started out suspending the RTC 360 from this telescopic boom crane. Um, it was really cool, but it, it proved to be a bit cumbersome. It was hard to stabilize in the in the wind, and we could only mount it with an inverted inverted option. We couldn't mount it right side up. Um, we went through a few versions of trying to get this to work, but we were really just getting some shaky scans and found that we didn't have a super stable um, base to work off of. So we went, we went explored a few more. Um, we actually ended up building a prototype of a scatter cart out of a bunch of two by fours and testing that out. And that seemed pretty stable and seemed to work pretty well. So another plus to this was that we could mount it either on the top or the bottom. We, we went and we took this prototype and had a metal fabricator fab this cart out of lightweight aluminum and had them design it and fab it in a way so that we could take the arm off, disassemble it, move it where we have to. We actually just shipped this out to Seattle to do a scan for another project that we're on. Um, so this kind of thing, we can break it down, ship it across the country if we need to, and it's proved very, very useful. But what you see in these images is how we suspended it out over the deck of the building to capture data that we needed from the outside that we couldn't see from the ground. So I think this, this is kind of unique. I don't know that many people have done that with the RTC 360 before. You know, much to the dismay of some people, <laughs> suspending a expensive scanner out over the side. But um, we did right. took multiple steps to ensure that um, you know we we worked through all the issues we were we were facing and it was stable. So another consideration we had to, to take into account was we were capturing these point clouds, but if we're capturing point clouds that are not a, not on control. When we were processing them and exporting them, nothing was lining up with the model. We were kind of just floating out in space. So, you know, our geolocated scan, which is the scan tied to real world coordinates, is only as good as our survey. Um, so, that was a challenge that we had to overcome and that we've kind of had as a takeaway is the importance of having either a good surveyor or survey really in house. So, we did. We had to locate the existing survey with uh, existing monuments, kind of traverse in. We had to set targets on new col on existing columns and new columns um, just to pr provide that control. And we resurveyed this new control and targets so we could register these scans. We actually ended up uh, pouring these concrete bollards. They, they go like three or four feet into the ground. And then we got the um, rotating survey targets to put on the top of them. So that pro proved to be a pretty useful strategy uh, until they got knocked down, but um, I'll get into that in a bit. Um, but this allowed us to set up a system of control around the perimeter of the building that would serve as a long-term uh, monument, and we didn't have to go and move targets every every few days as as the site conditions were changing. So. so once we had our federated design model and we had our point cloud we had to figure out how to get these two together. Um, so again, most of our subs were modeling in different coordinate systems. They didn't really have a cohesive system defined. So we went off the design coordinates and got, got everyone in the same design coordinate space so that we had a, a cohesive model. We now had to figure out how to get this federated model to align with the point clouds. So we used our civil files to basically just identify base points in the design model and transfer them to our state plane coordinate system, which was represented with our civil file. Uh, one takeaway from this was the importance of including this step in the BIM execution plan if scanning is included in the scope of the project, um, which would avoid having to move our design model later on. You know, for one of our more recent projects, we actually gave all our subs a uh, Revit template that had 
the a survey point, project base point, shared coordinate system, so that once everyone exported with those shared coordinates, they would all fall right in in the same place in this NAT83 state plane system, and our scans would fall right on top of them. So once we finally had all these aligned, we were able to start our analysis. Um, so what you're seeing is the scans overlaid on the model based on where they were geolocated to. Um, so we were able to kind of compare the as-built scans to the as-designed model and see where we were off. This is where Verity came in. So we did, we did a lot of visual analysis, but there were areas where we couldn't, you know, couldn't immediately see how far steel was off. So we took our, our cleaned point clouds in, into Navisworks and our federated exterior submodel. We ran Verity, which you know, was provided by ClearEdge and proved to be very helpful. Um, we, and we were actually able to see the delta in a lot of pieces of steel. So for instance, this is what we call our, our WT6 monitor steel. Um, and these are running vertically at the east and west ends of the building. So we were able to identify the delta between the as-designed model, which is what you see on the right side in pink, and the as-built model, where Verity's algorithm identified probably the highest com concentration of points and therefore where the actual member was located in the field. So we're able to do this for multiple steel members. For steel members such as these tubes, where framing was attaching directly to, as well as I-beams, where any sort of deflection um, had to be recognized because it would mean panels might sit lower than they were supposed to and not line up with certain joints. As we can see, we're, we kind of were able to flag every piece that was out of tolerance and provide all this information to our subs. We're able to also do this with our, we had clips that were welded to the steel um, that our framing members, which supported these ACM panels, were attached to. So we're able to do a kind of micro analysis of this and see and advise our framing sub how far off they were with these clips and what adjustments need to be made, whether they had to do a, a sister stud on one of their framing members or if we could move these, these clips. So that proved to be really useful. So what we ended up giving with this analysis, um, we gave our subs an as-built point cloud of the steel, a verity analysis on these steel numbers, which was a, an interactive HTML report. We also did a huge visual analysis PDF, which is kind of what you see at the bottom. We took section cuts down the length of, for instance, that is our high roof area there. We took section cuts down the entire length and um, compiled this big visual analysis that showed the model overlaid on the point cloud or vice versa, and the variation that we saw down the length of the structure. We also gave as-built model sections. So what you're seeing um, in yellow there, those are steel members where we actually used Verity to push the elements to where they were located in the scans. Um, so Verity has that really cool feature where you can um, basically take, take the geometry and take that individual element in the model and push it to where it recognizes the point cloud to be. So we're able to update this in, in areas that needed to be tweaked and hand this over to subs so they could model off of that. So what we found, uh, especially in our high roof, was the steel was very far out of tolerance. So we had to take a combined approach of refabbing panels in certain areas and resetting smaller steel areas to make the panel system work. And we needed large amounts of adjustment to our engineered framing system to fit between steel and the cladding and still maintain wind, lo wind loads. So, I mean, this was all information that if we kind of just tried to fit our panels on based off of all the drawings that we had wouldn't really have worked. And we would have ran into these issues later rather than sooner. So it was good to be able to identify all these. So what you're saying, this seeing here, this is uh, a bit of that visual analysis I, I talked about earlier. So this is, for instance, section cut 46 versus 41. I think these are about 20 or 30 feet apart, apart from each other on our high roof area. And this just shows, you can see at the top part, 
in everything in red is our model and the gray is our scan. So you can see this top part here, for instance, at this section, our bent plate at the top is significantly lower than the as design model. And if you go about 20 feet down the building, it is about to the same elevation as our design model. So this is what we were seeing down the length of it. We were basically up and down, and this meant that the panels on our roof were not going to fit because this vent plate had been essentially heightened due to the, the delta up and down. So this was an area where we did have to reconfigure some panels. We were able to salvage about 80% of it, and we just had to have one, one, one nose cone piece remade. Um, so we were able to work with the field to do a mock-up. Uh, we basically used the high and low points identified in our roof steel scan to create a new panel profile that would fit the variations in the steel. We completed this mock-up in the field. We scanned it and overlaid the panel on the, on the submodel. And we gave this to our panel sub and they were able to fabricate their new nose cone piece from this. Again, so we were able to salvage every piece except for this little curved one at the top. We had to open up the throat of that so that it would fit on this extended bent plate area. Other areas where we didn't have to necessarily make any adjustments to panels, but we were able to provide the steel sump contractor data so that they could fix their work was, for instance, on our low roof. We used a combination of scans and survey to create as built of the steel in this area. So for instance, that low and high point that you're seeing there, we were at 103.61 feet foot elevation in one of our, our low steel members and 103.76 foot elevation in one of our high members. So we were able to have them, I think we, we dropped the high one down. So it was at the same elevation as the other one and we were able to make little adjustments like this uh, throughout different areas of the project so that we could fit our panels on. I think we a couple areas here, we were only off by like a quarter of an inch, so we were able to tweak our framing design without having to change steel or panels. But this was really valuable because it kind of let us capture all everything that was there as it was built and then evaluate how we could fix it with minimal cost and allowed us to work with our framers and our engineers to see what was still acceptable with tweaking the design um, that we could still maintain wind loads and still maintain the ratings that we needed. So this was really valuable. Continuing on the project, we were doing progress scans and framing and sheathing just as a like QC to ensure the panels would fit. So overlaying that on the model, making sure that this framing and sheathing wasn't too far out from where it was supposed to be, making sure it wasn't walking at all. Another thing that we had to take into consideration was down the 500 foot length of this building, we only had about a quarter of an inch of tolerance for these panels to move because we had to have every panel joint align with our curtain wall and mega wall joints. So at the top of the panels and at the bottom of the panels, um, all of our joints had to align with the glass. So we really didn't have any room for error. And if we had uh, any error in the joints between panels, that would kind of compound down the length of the entire building. And if we even tried to cheat it a little bit, that it would have kind of pushed all the joints down, it wouldn't have worked. So this was an ongoing effort to make sure that our framing was actually in the right place and that once we put the panels on, our joints were gonna be in the correct location. So just some more screenshots of that. Um, on the left is an image before the mega wall at the ground floor there was in, and to the right is, is after that was in. Um, so that was another important thing we learned that I'll get into a bit on the next slide, but kind of the communication with the fields and making sure that everyone is following the same control lines, is working in the same coordinate system, has reliable has a reliable layout crew, um, and is working with the surveyor. So yeah, some of our takeaways, um, number one, communication with the field and definitely crucial that we're all, we're all doing the same thing with control lines, that they're laid out correctly, that everyone's following them. Um, another, just logistically making sure that your field knows not to take a forklift and run over your targets, because that happened a few times. Um, only a few. <laughs> only a few. Um, 
Yeah, bright, bright orange concrete bollards are not indestructible and I guess not always visible. So <laughs> definitely communication with all the supers, all the the foremen from, from all the trades, just making sure everyone's on the same page. And I think an important takeaway was that uh, it's important to keep everyone informed of your end goal and why you're doing this. You know, sometimes it's hard for for people, especially um, when you have such a large field crew to understand exactly you know, why we're doing this scanning and what it's needed for, but it is important work and kind of keeping everyone in the loop. And there were times where we would go out and actually show people out in the fields on our iPads, like this is what we're capturing and this is what we need to do with this data. Um, and just kind of keeping everyone involved and letting them know and letting them feel like they're a part of the process was was valuable in on this project. Um, Another consideration was our schedule and time frame, making sure it's in line with supply chain shortages, sub capabilities, and manpower. As I mentioned, we kind of had to had to run with prefabbing these panels based off the model. Um, so it just had some challenges we had to work around, but I, I think taking on a project with this large of a scanning scope and trying to um, deliver this, this accurate level of data um, definitely doable and we made it work, but it is important in pre-planning on a project like this that we consider our schedule, our time frame, and sub capabilities with both with modeling as well as just being able to to assist and, and work as a team. Um, a third one, the importance of having a consistent survey or, or in-house survey. Uh, there were a few times where we would shoot the same points and get different values each time. So I think it, it's really important that we have a, a surveyor who is uh, well-versed and experienced or that you're doing survey in-house because as we mentioned, like your geolocated scan is only as good as your survey, right? If we have, if you have like six targets and two of them are off, um, or if we have if we have three targets, which is the minimum we would need and, and two of them are off, uh, our scan's not gonna come out correctly or if we're given data in the wrong format, like text value wise, um, we're not gonna have a model that's accurate. So just definitely a consideration we had to take into account moving forward. Um, again, number four, the definition of the coordinate system and the BIM execution plan. You know, traditionally, um, projects will have like a design coordinate system and not necessarily take into account a state plane coordinate system that might be needed to have a real, real world location. So again, this is something that we implemented moving forward on other projects, basically providing a template file and saying that, hey, we're scanning on this project. This is the coordinate system that our surveyor is going to give us points in. So this is where our point cloud model is going to end up. We need you to export your model with shared coordinates that we provide you so that you are in that same coordinate system. So we're not trying to take a model that's at like a zero, zero, zero origin point and move it to something that's, you know, 250,000 feet north or south. Um, a, another one is having a contingency plan or an ability to pivot. So the original scope of this project was a bit different than the end result. Um, and again, we kind of worked through challenges we faced and made it work. And I think that was, because of the flexibility of the team and the ability to kind of recognize when we are running into a roadblock and adapt. Um, that, that being said, teamwork was incredibly important on this project. So from our design team, our architects, engineers, the delegated design team, so our framers and, and their engineering crew, our scanning team, our surveyors, our subcontractors, our management and field teams, it's really important making sure that all of the office and the field are receiving the same info, that we're communicating properly, um, that we're having you know weekly meetings, that we're all looking at scan data together um, and considering the implications of it. So for instance, we do a scan, we say, hey, this member is off you know, three quarters of an inch to the north. So what does that mean? Oh, well, this could push your curtain wall out. This could push your panels out so they won't be in line. Kind of having members from each trade look at the data and just agree what what the implications of of the data are um not just having you know one one sub say oh well that doesn't affect me or that's fine and then having another sub um you know saying that will basically ruin their their whole uh 
line of, of items and on that side. So important that everyone's just reviewing the data together and working together to solve problems. Um, so yeah, these are just some images of the panels actually today. Um, shout out to one of our project engineers that just ran out there and took some for me. Um, yeah, this is our north facade of the building. So this is the, the length of it. And these are what we call our, our belly panels. And we're still working around the corners, but we are mostly mostly up on these sides. And um, yeah, again, it was just a really big collaborative process. We couldn't, I don't think we could have done it without the scanning technology as well as the uh, communication and help from all of our subcontractors, our field team, our super that's leading this. Um, just a, a really big team effort and uh, happy what, of what we accomplished. But, yeah. Yeah, that's a really cool project. And I mean, I, I would agree. It seems like it would, it would have been incredibly difficult to pull off accurately and, and have everything lined up without basically all of that coming together, um, you know, in the different ways. Um, well, cool. Thank you for the, the presentation. It's, it's a very cool project. Uh, and it looks like it would have been it's a pain in the butt, but um, definitely, definitely well done. Um, Thank you. We'll see. So we have a few people who put some questions in. So at this point, you know, we have Q&A. So anyone who has any questions, like please put your uh, questions in and, and we can kind of go through those. Um, one question that I had is just, uh, you know, kind of takeaways from this. So it sounds like, you know, one of the things you guys have learned is, is providing a Revit template to, to start with a coordinate system. And, and that's definitely a big factor for any of this stuff coming together, is especially federation and, and getting that all lined up. Are there any, any other things that you guys learned or like takeaways uh, that, you know, as far as potentially that you would want to put in other projects or anything else kind of along those lines? Yeah, I mean, definitely the importance of that, of that template file and um, just defining that in the BIM execution plan stage. Um, I think that's, that's a huge one as well as just vetting your subcontractors and, and making sure that they have the BIM capabilities that you need on a project. And the a big thing we found is just the willingness to work with them, kind of the value that having a VDC engineer on site brings to a project. Because if you have a bunch of subs who know how to model, but are kind of new to this whole scanning and cord like, Real, real world coordinate systems and getting everything to align and modeling based off of a point cloud. It's really helpful to have someone on site who can work with them either in the trailer or through Zoom calls and someone who's like dedicated to that project to solve these little issues and to help to help the team just solve tech challenges. Um, that was really helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, ton of takeaways from this project. Uh, Another one, like we mentioned, inform your field crew not to knock down your targets. <laughs> yeah. um, Seems like a good one. Um, let's see. All right. So yeah, we did we got a bunch of questions actually. So we want to go through these. Uh, one one comment was uh, when are you guys going to patent that uh, that little cart to put the just to hang your very expensive scanner outside of the off the side of the building? <laughs> we, we should. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks like a good design for that too. Uh, let's see. Uh, did you have anything to verify if the like the, the actual field work issues versus the scan alignment versus the registration issue? So uh, of just kind of how, how are you validating where the problem was as far as, you know, whether whether it was a coordinate system, you know, mis, misread read or the model wasn't aligned properly? Like, how did you kind of hash out where the real problem was? Yeah, so that was that was a big one. Um... We actually had our in-house survey from another one of our offices come in and verify basically the points and the control lines that our surveyor at, on, on site had laid. Um, and then I went and I put down targets on the decks at the intersection of control lines where we had northing, easting, and elevation coordinates already. I basically took a civil 3D file of that um, of those control lines and all those points and overlaid that with our scan and like visually made sure like zooming in that the exact center of our targets were on all those those points in the civil 3d file so yeah. kind of ensuring that like yeah we were we were definitely geolocated correctly um but even then uh it was it was really hard because this whole acm system it didn't have a break point 
It was wrapped around the entire 500 foot length of the structure as well as up and around it and across the roof. And there was nowhere where we had to say like, okay, like this is quadrant one and then we can like analyze that and then analyze quadrant two separately. Like we had to take this entire building into account and yeah. like overlay that on the model and analyze it. So that was definitely challenging. Um, yeah, I would say just ver verifying that our survey was correct and that our, our targets were coming in correctly, that our control lines were were lining up with where they were scanned. Um, that was very important. Um, yeah, we yeah. we actually we did a few different studies. Um, so we would we did like a where where the model fell, uh, right? Like geolocated where sorry where where the point cloud fell geolocated versus the model. Um, mm -hmm. We did a whole analysis based off that, and just to provide different scenarios and and double check, we would actually like push the point cloud up a little bit and say, okay, this is aligned at this deck. So this is your your reference point of where we're working off of and we're still this far off, we're still that far off. Um, so kind of just gave a few different scenarios. Um, so it was really that, as well as just working with our field team, like verifying measurements in the field. We still did back checks, like we shot lasers, we surveyed elevations of certain points, um, yeah. just so we could verify that all the data we were getting with these scans was was in fact correct. So. Yeah, so definitely a lot of work, but for the level of tolerances, it was definitely necessary too for, for what you guys were trying to achieve. Yeah, and I don't I don't think we could have used another scanner. Um I mean, we have a BLK to go as well, but we opted for the RTC three sixty just because of the level of accuracy it provides and the density of the point clouds. I mm -hmm. it would have been really difficult trying to trying to use any other scanner. For sure. Uh let's see, I have uh, another question. What what were the tolerances that you were kind of dealing with? Uh, as far as like what what was kind of the minimum tolerance that you were you're seeing and and you know like how how small did it get down to so i think we had about a quarter of an inch of tolerance for those panels to move um so that was another another big challenge is just you know when you scan you have, you have a small compounded error of tying all those scans together as well as any error that might be present in your survey so that was what was so important with back checking everything in the field and shooting elevation marks and just verifying that our data was correct. Um, yeah, we, we had like a quarter of an inch tolerance down the entire building. So uh, one of the questions is, do you, do you think you could have spotted an eighth of an inch if, uh, tolerance like variance at that point? And like, would you have been able to do that with the workflow or was it kind of the, that quarter inch is about the max that you could have spotted? I think we could have. Um, I think we definitely could have if we had focused on one area of the building, like if we were just looking at like the east facade and we ran Verity on that, um, not taking into account like the rest of the building, I think it, it would have been easier to to narrow down even even an even tighter tolerance and flag that. Mm -hmm. And when you were, uh, so another question, uh, when you guys were installing this deal, were you doing any kind of QA on the fly to, you know, using scanning or anything to like check as it was being installed or was it kind of installed and then it was just looking back after it was installed to see where it ended up? It was a little bit of both. Um, for a lot of the project, we had steel that was moving. So members that were up, but like weren't welded 100% into place and we were kind of waiting on the steel subcontractor to finalize their work because we didn't want to provide and or we didn't want to scan and provide any data when members weren't in their final resting place. We also had a lot of movement, so steel structures like that aren't super common in South Florida. Um, we have, you know, temperature variations and environmental <laughs> challenges to face with um, steel expanding and contracting. So there were there were times where like we scan we we like tried to scan before the steel was finalized and we would do it at like early morning and then afternoon a day later and the, the site conditions were so dynamic that we were we were getting not only environmentally but just with with like work that was going on we're we're not getting 100 percent accurate data so we kind of opted to try and let them finalize their work first before we provided that gotcha yeah no, that makes sense um, let's see, uh, this is an interesting question. So like it sounded like the plan was originally that you were going to, you know, install everything and then measure everything after it was installed and then have prefab created based off of what was installed. Um, Correct. But the 
that obviously changed pretty dramatically. From a budgetary point of view, how did that kind of change things up for you guys? Like, was that kind of already allocated? Did that, that drastically affect the budget? Like, how, how did that end up kind of playing out? So I can't speak 100% to the budget. I, I, try and, I try and let other people handle the money. Um, but I, I, I think that it ended up still saving us money because mm -hmm. if we didn't release those panels when we did because of all the supply chain shortages we were facing with COVID, we wouldn't mm -hmm. have had material on site. So uh, there were a lot of areas of this project where you kind of had to weigh like, okay, we maybe don't have like an accurate enough area to do that scan for prefab, but if we don't order it right now, we're not gonna have it in time. So mm -hmm. do we wait and risk product coming late and like risking our end date or do we just release it now and then make the substructure work to the final exterior? So it's kind of yeah. like a, re a reverse puzzle piece. It was like we had our panel and then we had to reverse engineer and make sure everything beneath it fit kind of rather than the other way around. Um, yeah, it was it was challenging, but I, I think I, I want to say budget wise, we we probably ended up in the, in the same area. Um, but we, we definitely had some issues because because of the way our steel was installed. Um, I don't know who ended up absorbing that cost in the end, but we definitely had exhibits to show our steel contractor that where their work was off. So yeah. I know there are discussions about trying to share that cost between different parties. I, uh, and that, you know, from a uh, from the Verity side, that's what we do. We do like is the being able to have that kind of accuracy that you can say like, here's here's where it happens, you know, here's where it is, and and after that, it's a different discussion. But at least knowing where where things are wrong and and what needs to be adjusted is is definitely helpful. Yeah. Um. Let's see. So a couple of, we've been getting a bunch of questions. So uh, let's see. So one was uh, from the scanning side. So for scanning, were you doing like a bunch of cloud to cloud first? and then aligning that to the survey coordinate system or was it doing a couple scans and, and just aligning those directly to the coordinate system like how like in your scanning how are you kind of putting together uh the scans that you were actually doing the comparison with so um that was another kind of like workflow that we had to refine um we started out that like oh we'll just scan this 20 40 foot section of the building and once we apply control in register 360 we'll that will fall into the exact same place as the scan that we might do of the next 20 feet the next day. But mm -hmm. because of how dynamic the site conditions were, that wasn't always the case. So we found that capturing data, we would really have to just block off a big portion of time when the site wasn't busy. And that was optimal, like coming in on a Sunday and just scanning the whole area that we needed, like the whole like belly panel area, um, capturing all those targets uh using we, we would we would do a bunch of setups pre-link them with the field 360 app and bring them into register 360 um run cloud to cloud and then apply control using our our targets um that's that's generally generally was our workflow was trying to capture as much of an area as we can rather than trying to like piecemeal it together day by day because sometimes the site would change gotcha um, yeah, it kind of along those lines about, you know, coordination and timing. So it sounds like, so you came in on like a Sunday and would, would do the scanning and that would be kind of prepped for the week. It sounds like, is that, is that how you guys did timing or, or like, how are you basically getting the data and then getting enough time to, to give that feedback back to the, the trades? Right. So, um, it was, if it was, it, I, ideally we would come in on a Sunday and scan the whole thing and we we did do that in in some areas but when we needed like a more micro analysis or if the field noticed an area that hey we might be having an issue here or something visually looks off we would go and just like an afternoon let's say like Monday afternoon at like four when the site's w w winding down we would go out and scan you know a whole corner of the building making sure that we're capturing targets then we would process it usually like the next day or I'd I'd leave it running overnight if I could get everything imported by then um so usually by the next day within like 24 to 48 hours we'd have that data and we had weekly meetings where every week we would review with everyone on the calls um what we were seeing in the scans mm -hmm. so it was, it was generally like once a week capture and then review data in those meetings but that that could be that was adjusted like again if, if issues were coming up and we're like we need we need an asphalt of this area because we think we might 
face an issue here. Like we would just go out and then like off off that main meeting sidebar just to review that data like the next day. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and there's, uh, there's a lot of questions on the scanning side. So uh, registrate like for when you were scanning, what, what was the standard like resolution you were using for the RTC high, medium, low? So we were using medium um, with pictures on medium. Uh, I had to do double pass a few times because the site wasn't always empty. So to eliminate all those moving moving targets. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we ever scanned on well we, we did a few lows um when we had to just go out and capture something really quick when i had like 15 minutes before like yeah. before it would start raining and we needed that data today i would just go out and do it on low but our our general settings were, were yeah medium resolution images on so we got a colorized point cloud gotcha cool um let's see a uh, kind of final couple questions here um Let's see. And again, I think this is kind of just along the lines of like how to align the coordinate system. So it wasn't, it, you were generally taking a couple scans, doing cloud to cloud, and then after, you know, to get those basically lined up and then and then surveying those in based on the targets. Is that, did I catch that correctly? I, I, that's kind of some of the questions that we said. Um, um, See, so yeah, I mean, every, every scan we did, we would make sure that we were capturing at least three targets. Okay, and gotcha. then we would take those into Reg360 and apply control to geolocate them. Um, okay. That was th at least three targets with our smaller scans. Again, I ideally, what the workflow we wanted to follow was and what we tried to push was rather than doing a small section, doing like an entire building portion and yeah. hitting multiple targets and then taking those into 360 and applying applying control to those targets. Gotcha. And averaging that out to make sure you get a consistency across that. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, this is a good question. So, uh, a big question with anyone who's dealt with scanners is how are you dealing with the, the scan data, like the actual size of the data? I mean, obviously RTC can make some pretty big files pretty fast. Yeah. Um, how did you deal with versioning and storage and, and processing? Like kind of what was your workflow, you know, to get results out of that? That is an ongoing discussion with our IT team. Um, <laughs> yeah. For many companies, so... it's ongoing. <laughs> We actually had these huge, um, per, I think, precision towers built for this. We have like 256 gigs of RAM and, and uh, like two, I think our newest one is four terabyte storage drive. So we would, um, the registry 60, the, the like project data folder where it stores all the projects, we would keep that not on our C drive, we would keep that on our larger storage drive. Um, and I would like index, um, the project after every kind of major milestone. So I wouldn't be saving versions like every scan we did. Um, I kept for the first half of the project, like everything everything in the, in the same project file, just in a different sitemap. Um, mm -hmm. And then as we got to later scans, uh, or like scans like post sheathing, I started another project. Um, in terms of backup and sharing on those, uh, we don't. We you know, we're still we're we're still fighting the file sizes for cloud storage with that. So um, a lot of that has just been backing up to external SSDs. Um, and then like with some a product I'm working on now, we're actually shipping out SSDs to um, our supers on the other side of the country where we where we did that scanning project, as well as to um, our other team members who are doing a scan to BIM model of it. So mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, it's it's a good, it's a good question, and it's, it's definitely yeah. an ongoing one, and you know, yeah. one I've seen other companies struggle with as well is just finding that cloud storage option that is big enough for these files as well as affordable enough. So yeah, yeah, that's that's always a big one. Um, cool. Uh, I think we're getting close here. Uh, I guess I had some questions on for you know using Verity and kind of that workflow. So you were bringing in that scan data after everything because the biggest part is coordination. And that's something for Verity and for any of this is you have to have everything in the right place. And that that's the most work as far as, you know, from what we've seen and, and what it sounds like. Um, but, you know, we're using that for, for running the analysis and kind of working through it. Is that something that you did a lot of like smaller analysis where you would run, you know, a couple, couple sections or were you kind of doing like big bulk inspections where you're saying like, I want to check, you know, this whole side of the building uh, and, and looking at that in more of a, a big batch? So definitely a, more of a small batch microanalysis. 
we would really like kind of just inspect the model visually and any areas that that like we that were blatantly off we would kind of section those off and be like all right we clearly have an issue here let's look at other areas where it's not so obvious and that's kind of where the meat and bones of our verity workflow was um mm -hmm. like in areas where steel was only a little bit off and we weren't sure if it was more than a quarter of an inch you couldn't really tell just by looking at it we would would run verity in small portions of that so like one day I might do like a 20 foot section of the building and my follow up the next day with the next 20 feet, um, like all, all from the same scan, but just Verity in little digestible chunks that we could uh, kind of, let's solve this 20 feet and then move on to the next 20 foot span. Cool. Um, yeah, I think, um, so I think that is most of the questions. I think we covered basically everything. It's, uh, with the last couple minutes of the webinar, I mean, we could definitely end early, but if any other questions that anyone has, definitely toss it in. Uh, who, do you, did you use an LOE from the US IBD? Um, yeah, what, what is the, what is the uh, LOA, LOA? LOA of, uh, I'm not sure what that is actually. Um, I'm not sure. You, yeah, the LOA from the US IBD. Do you know it? Are you familiar with that? Um, I'm not entirely sure what we used. Um, I don't. I know the steel subcontractor had a certain um, standard they had to follow in terms of accuracy, oh, accuracy. and then okay. in terms of our models, um, mm -hmm. our our LOD on our models was varied from tree to tree. I think on our steel we were at like an LOD 400, um, but that was that was a pretty in depth model. We had nuts yeah. and bolts and everything in there. Mm. And yeah, and so for the level of accuracy, was it more of just based off of the the necessary accuracy? It was really it was just these panels need to fit. So <laughs> whatever whatever that minimum tolerance is for that is effectively kind of how you structured the the like to get to the quarter inch that you had to work with for the tolerance. Yeah, I mean we kind of had to work backwards, like identifying what the largest tolerance we had was, and then just refining our workflow to make sure that we were hitting that. Yeah, gotcha. Well, um, I think we are basically, I, I think that covers uh, all the questions we had. Uh, the last question is, is this, is this being recorded? Yes, it is. So anyone who signed up for the webinar uh, will receive an email with a link to go check out the recording in a couple of days. Um, I definitely want to thank, uh, you know, thank you, Logan, for this uh, really interesting project. And, and it sounds like a lot of stuff that you had to solve and uh, and hopefully some stuff you learned for the next project. And uh, thank you, Eric, uh, Richie, for, for being in here and, and being ready for answering any questions if there was anything on the RTC specifically. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everyone's time and uh, and and thanks everyone for, for joining today. Thank you for having me. Yep, thank you as well.